last things. What's up, everyone? I'm chilling here, getting ready. Weasel is uh, Weasel's ready. He's got to get into the good internet room, the room where he's got the good Wi-Fi. Um, good Wi-Fi is harder to come by than you would expect um, for these streams, you know, because we want to keep that dialogue snappy, the back and forth, especially with Weasel, you know. it's He's not like a... He's not like a slow talker guy where you just say something and then there can be a two second delay and then he replies slowly. You know, we're gonna need we're gonna need that velocity. Velocity is a word that Weasel has used in the past to describe his music. Um and uh well I could do sort of you know well, okay, up top, some non uh things not related directly to this. Uh, to this particular podcast. Uh, the last thing's Discord. We're definitely open for new people to come join if you want to join. Um, it's been a really, uh, yeah, it's super fun, but it's like a small group, but everyone's sticking around and just having a blast. Uh, so it's super vibrant. We're doing a book club in there too. We've read some Jacques Attali. We're going to read some Adorno soon, I think. So um, here, let's um, let's bring Weasel in. Let's see how that um, let's see how that connection's uh, doing. What's up, man? I am plagued by technology perpetually. <laughs> ah, let's see. Wait, say something really quickly right after this. Okay, I will. Oh, that was a fucking delay, dude. That is a delay. Um, well, we should probably just do it anyway. I, I can't be fucking I, I can't be canceling or postponing any more podcasts. I'm already it's 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 getting to like this sort of uh tarnishing the un you know, the professional rep and stuff. So um here. What okay, I am yeah. gonna do though, I am gonna reach over and close the door and then I'll give you a little uh, a little intro. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, gang. Welcome. We've got Weasel Walter here joining me. Really, really pleased. Uh, people have been asking. I was gonna, I was gonna invite him anyway. Considering, will he want to do it? Is this the kind of thing he wants to do? But of course, of course, it is because we talk. Weasel, Weasel is uh, not like uh, a shy guy. <laughs> but uh, so, so okay. Like real quick. Uh, I mean, everyone watching this knows Weasel. Actually, no, not necessarily. Sometimes people just tune in. Um, Weasel is, how do we even start? Composer, uh, percussionist, guitarist, improviser, and producer. Um, I don't know if he calls himself that, but yeah, engineer. And um, I've known Weasel for like, sure. this is fucked up, dude. I've known Weasel for 20 years now, I think is correct. Um, I first met Weasel. Probably more. Uh, Probably more. Well, in 2002, I first, yeah, I mean, I knew who Weasel was in my early 20s, and I, I, I think the first thing was I, I asked you to play at Wesleyan when I was there, right? I think that, no. that was it. I think it was 2001, though. Was it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe so. Because, yeah, you were yeah. doing a Lutenbacher's tour. Well, um, Infection and Decline was out. So, and you were doing mm -hmm. a, um, you were doing a solo version of that, at least on that tour with backing tracks. And I think you were playing bass. Um, 2002 then. That, yeah, that would have been 2002. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, Juan, Juan says he was three years old in 2002. That's awesome. See, we got Zoomers, man. This isn't just the olds. Um, oh, Weasel, are you looking at the comments on the side? Because you, you can do that. You can check them out. If you, if you go to... Uh, if you click on comments over there, you can see people ask questions, and they're not just a bunch of retards. People oh, sure. are cool on this. They'll, they'll, they, they might ask like some <laughs> legit, some legit questions that you actually want to answer. Um, but so yeah, man. I mean, we, Weasel has so many okay. fucking projects. He's probably best known for the Flying Lutenbachers, which was uh, together in the 2000s through early 10s, or no, just 2000s, and now has uh, reformed gloriously with two new records in the past couple of years also cellular chaos is a band that people know about and um 
he's shaking his head uh and uh and just like a billions of other projects um especially a lot of improvised stuff in the past uh 10 15 years so um dude what's the um well let's do let's let's start out let's start out slow man pharaoh sanders rest in All peace right, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, kind of an influence. Um, when I was first getting into free jazz, I was about 15 years old and I got into it through the public library. And I think hearing Pharaoh Sanders on those late, um, the, the late Coltrane records kind of blew my mind. I, it was the most aggressive playing I'd heard anybody make from a saxophone. So I think it's pretty sad influence on me. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah. The aggression, the aggression, man. Was that was was he more yeah. important to you than than John Coltrane at that at that time? Actually, no. no. I bet Pharaoh Sanders didn't make a lot of solo records that I liked. He had a lot of kind of one chord, two chord vamp material that I wasn't really too into. I was into his voice on the saxophone, and he's certainly on a lot of good records I like, but. Um, John Coltrane, hmm, that's that's a big one. I mean, that's like one of the biggies. So you were already deep on on Coltrane when you heard when you heard uh, you were already deep in, into Coltrane before you heard Pharaoh Sanders on those on those late records. Well, I was getting into free jazz at that point, and there was sort of a, a canon of stuff that was easy to access, which was Ornette Coleman. Uh, late John Coltrane stuff, um, you know, and then you had your Cecil Taylors and Albert Eilers after that, and then it gets more obscure from there on in. But it li literally, I stumbled onto free jazz vis-a-vis -vis punk, and then into no way the more experimental wing of punk, I guess you could argue, and then free jazz was sort of the next step because there was a lot of overlap in the New York scene between the no wave scene and some aspects of the free jazz scene, so... I just wanted more noisy crap. I was into like Resonance Third Reich and Roll album, and I, I was I was obsessed with dissonance and crazy shit. So um, checking out free jazz was just the next step. And the library had John Coltrane records and had Pharaoh Sanders records and Cecil Taylor records and all this stuff that you know blew my mind when I was fifteen years old or so. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I, I kind of got into free jazz from the two angles of, like, sort of that angle, like, just being into cra wanting mm -hmm. the crazy shit, but then also from, like, playing yeah. straight-ahead jazz, which was never, like, my mm. passion, but it was, like, a thing I was, like, in, sort of into, like, studying, and you know, like, on that level, and then it was, like, oh, okay, more mm -hmm. out, more out, more out, and then there's this line, like, traditional jazz people, there's, like, this line where it's, like, okay, now, now we're out. At, you know, so I was like, okay, what's past that, like, event? I remain... Uh, yeah. Well, I remain a freak, uh, and I went from the outside in. I don't have an, an insanely huge love of straight-ahead jazz, but I, I'm, I'm into good old 20th century modernism in general. I have dissonant ears. I don't know why. I just got turned on to weird music really young, and I, I craved the sound of dissonance and chaos in music. Right? Yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. Although, but like, you know, there is jazz kind of in your playing, but maybe just like through free jazz, right? Like, like that, that's, that's, what's weird to me. Like I think about like, and it's not weird that it, yeah. that's in your playing, but it, a, a, an issue like, or not an issue. Okay. I often think about the thing of like tradition where it's like, you totally can absorb, I think, Charlie Parker through Ornette Coleman without necessarily... I mean, you can absorb so much of older stuff without necessarily going to it and, like, studying it. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Like, it's, like it's in uh, there. It, it had to appeal to me on a number of levels. I mean, I you know, a, a, a more straight-ahead example of jazz is is the late Andrew White who died recently and his maniacal approach to hard bop was so extreme, it's extreme on another level altogether I mean it's very chromatic stuff I you wouldn't really call it free jazz because it's over jazz changes 
But um, I guess, uh, you know, Juan Boris asks, why do you guys think some people tend to like dissonant music more than others? It's just a taste. I think some, I don't like onions, you know, other people like onions. I like, uh, you know, whatever. I, I, I don't know. I think for me, crystallized moments being very young, and hearing pretty out music it attractive to me I, I don't know it's just a taste i suppose yeah i always think i mean there is a certain personality type where you just want the next extreme thing i mean like when i was a kid even before experimental music you're just like yeah. okay metallica i bet there's something scarier like oh napalm death i bet there's something scarier anything disgusting pornography disgusting yeah. you know like horrific violence in movies i mean it's just it's like almost like there's just like a type of person that just wants to like you know like it certainly speaks to the human condition sadly I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially my motivations, why I was such a maniac for 30 years. And I feel like American society winds a lot of people up. I feel like it's almost like a dog, like fucking with a dog's face to make it mean or something. Um, I, you know, not to get too deep or anything, because huh, we never get too deep, right, Charlie? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Keep uh, it surface I've here. been thinking a lot about my motivation. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about my motivation, and I think that, one, I was obsessed with music, and I wanted to bear that out in as many ways as possible. And two, my manic output has to do with me just trying to prove that I'm valid to myself for what it's worth. Yeah, man. Yes. I mean, everyone is. That, that applies to everyone, but the fact that you're saying that about yourself in this sort of self-aware way definitely means something a little different probably than it means to, to, to everyone. I mean, like, I mean, do you feel like your set, your, your sense of feeling invalidated or self-worth, like it ends up resetting to like zero and shit and you have to like build it back up and shit. Like with each record, is that, is that, is it like that dark or like, um, it's pretty dark. It's not like that. <laughs> I do work with a therapist about these things and nice. uh, the conclusion sort of is that I have, this black hole inside of me that will pretty much never be fulfilled. So it's, it's a matter of managing it. Not so much as like, we're ever going to resolve this, um, condition men you know, mental condition that I have, which is probably just based on things that happened to me in my childhood and the way I was raised. I just, I, I just was always on a quest to prove I could do this and I could be the best or at least pretty good at it. And I could, um, that I had something to say and blah, blah, blah. Um, as I get older, uh, the ruthlessness of this motivation has come into question. Um, you get older and I, I haven't exactly had the easiest career. We'll put it that way. Not that anyone does. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's a lot of struggle and a lot of hardship. And I put up with a lot of bullshit to get to the point I am. And I'm not even sure what the point is is i have this mountain of accomplishments but then again at the end of the day is it satisfying not really i always want to do more but in a weird way i can't put myself through the paces i used to put myself through i just i can't do it physically and i don't want to do it so the problem is you know like everybody's jockeying for their position and culture right and the minute you're out of culture like unless if you're one of his chosen ones you're kind of forgotten so right now the struggle is to try to feel like I still have opportunities and I'm still relevant, but I'm not going to sleep on like four or three weeks and get, and get paid nothing to do it. Yeah. You know? No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about like physically, yeah, you get to a certain age that actually sleeping on a couch is biologically yeah. a different, a different proposition. But I, I mean, yes, a lot of the time I think about like, a lot of time I think about just like what what's the difference. There's a lot of stuff from like the time when we met, like when I was in my 20s, shit that like at the time I thought was career, mm -hmm. but it was actually just being cool in my 20s. Like, you know, like shit where there'd be like great turnouts mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, we're like part of this thing. And it like seemed like it was like, ah, yes, a music career. But actually it was just like, yeah, when you're in your 20s, there are these scenes and people hang out and like people go to shows like, you know what I mean? And so it's like, then you, getting in my thirties, yeah. it's like, Oh, okay. This is, this is what's actually the, a career 
versus what was just you know what i'm saying just like being social you know at a certain age yeah i, um, I don't think that i'm worried about being relevant to the kids or anything they've got their own thing going on it's not for me to be like trying to hijack everybody else's scene or or whatever that's not really the point um i think what i'm doing has a pretty specific focus that still appeals to some freaks though and yeah i don't care how old they are if they you know young or old bring them all on if they get it i'm happy to um connect with these people so yeah 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 totally i mean what what you've been doing you what you've been doing has not zigzagged into all kinds of like contradictory shit i mean you have a very consistent vibe even in thanks for noting totally even even in different approaches you know what i mean like i mean it's like you've been sort of maximizing the variety within this shit but it's like you know you have this voice uh that i think comes through whether it's in the improvised like totally free improvised stuff or the totally uh notated or or composed you know lutenbacher stuff i mean um but like uh yeah, I'm kind of interested. Yeah, just in like how how you've been relating to different like scenes and communities over the years, because it's like some things, like these things come and go, circles come and go. Like you yeah. were like like you were part like when I first heard about you, it was like it was like okay, Weasel Walters, this guy in Chicago, and at that point, like early 2000s, it was kind of still after like right after the 90s, so it's like. A, a like where you are geographically like mattered you know what i mean so i'm just like who do i know in the midwest like weasel's like this midwest cat you know um and and there was such a thing with like no wave in chicago in the 90s like i mean uh have you like did you feel as connected to that as like it seemed like you were it seemed like you were just embedded yeah in the guy well, that is called serendipity. That's called being in the right place at the right time. Um, I've been in some right places at right times, and then there's other periods it's where, boy, I am in the wrong place. But such is the nature of having a long career. After 30 years, I've, I've, I've watched it go up and down and up and down, and it doesn't freak me out anymore. Um, when, when the scenes kind of capsized and went away, that were so vibrant and then all of a sudden they're so dead. I think when I was younger, I used to panic and be like, is that it? Is that the peak? Um, I think being consistent to what I do, um, I'm definitely never fully in style, but I have various levels of being out of style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think as far as the Chicago yeah. thing goes, uh, in the 90s, the rent was cheap and there were a lot of weird freaks doing stuff and you didn't have to work very much. And we went nuts. And there was also um, bigger bands that were getting attention in Chicago. And we sort of glommed onto that attention in a peripheral way. So um, that was like a few years of pretty interesting activity. But then like most scenes, it, it starts to factionalize. People go in their own directions and do their own things, and there's no longer this tribe anymore. Everyone's kind of satellites. And I've gone through this whole thing of having a tribe and then having it burst out into satellites numerous times, and that's just how it works. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, um, yeah, that that's such a thing, like when there's a scene, there's a ton of little bands, and then there's a few bigger bands that are getting attention. That, that really makes something that 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 creates this uh ecosystem of vibes or something um i mean it was a very specific thing in chicago at that time that we're not going to just only do memory lane we're going to get current for sure but um but uh but some people watching might might not know uh uh just like chicago in the 90s i mean there was totally a j a free jazz thing and then this no wave thing and you were really in both i mean you weren't yeah. the only person overlapping obviously but um you always seemed like one of the people that was like the most yeah. overlapped with those two things yeah my i really loved the new york aesthetic from the 60s and the 70s in terms of this radical music and i related to it and i wanted to add my two cents to that ethos 
um, you know, doing it in my own way, building on the influences and even acknowledging them where credit do. Uh, when I came to Chicago, the free jazz thing, was, it was very passe. You basically had some kind of, it was pretty segregated too. You had a bunch of white players on the north side that nobody cared about. And then you had the, uh, the AACM sort of related um, people on the south side and the twain didn't mix that much at that point which is sad huh. because um um why not <laughs> but um when i came to town i with a banjo on my knee when i was 18 or 19 or whatever i wanted to play free jazz period and it took a while to meet some people um i was seen as rogue i was pretty feral um I'm not as feral as I once was, but maybe some people still think I am. That's fine, whatever. Uh, you know, when all is said and done, I think I was seen as sort of a rogue gadfly outlier or whatever you want to call it. So once the thing sort of took off officially in Chicago in the mid 90s, I had sort of alienated major people in that scene and I wasn't really, um, I was kind of shut out from the club. So I had to make my own thing. That's all. Um, and, and I doubled down on myself to answer your question. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I mean, one thing, one thing that I was thinking about, you know, is like free jazz is so, I mean, yes, it's uh, traditionally it's, you know, uh, from, from a normal person's perspective, it's chaotic, dissonant, uh, aggressive, mm -hmm. but there's generally there usually there's this warm uh hippie ish i mean hippie is a superficial but like a cosmic love kind of vibe going on whereas like free jazz or like improv it's like negative is uh a beautiful thing and i'm not pigeonholing your stuff as negative but i mean you know what i mean right yeah. like uh a, 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 a right i mean i'm not i'm not uh i'm not putting words in your mouth right like um there's a coldness. Well, the, the, although, okay, there's a certain coldness to your compositional aesthetic that is sort of there in your improvisation, but clearly it doesn't mean you yeah. can't play with people who are coming from a cosmic love place. But it's, 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 uh, do, I mean, do you feel any kind of disconnect there, either socially or aesthetically, between you and the more like hippie uh, strain of like the free jazz tradition? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, I'm, I'm really coming out of 20th century modernism. And uh, my therapist says I'm not a nihilist. Um, I think that's no, a fun way of describing oneself. Uh, not necessarily accurate. Look at the actual definition. But I think I always had a pretty dark attitude for whatever reasons. And I related to darkness in culture i mean in particular with no wave i could relate to this sort of like no budget um destroy everything um deconstructive sort of uh ethos of that and with free jazz i actually the righteous fury of the black power movement and the social rights movement in the 60s really appealed to me i thought it was just uh i thought it was really righteous and that that sort of um wanting to destroy the existing structures through chaos appealed to me that i'm this is i'm glad that you said this and this is interesting because um because yeah i know that you're not a nihilist uh and um but it's like there's a thing of uh like something like no wave or even just the spirit of punk um I, I don't think of that lineage as inherently nihilistic, but it's critical. Like critique yeah. is a part of it. So that's how I kind of think about it, you know, the sort of like in a non-exaggerated, non-hyped up way, you know, it's music that is saying, uh-uh, actually this, or calling out bullshit or calling something out or t yeah. deconstructing something, you know, um, which like more cosmic love type vibes aren't. But, but, but I, I'm psyched about what you said about the, about black power and black liberation, because I'm not shocked that you would say that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine you would go there. Uh, cause I, I mean, you tend to be like, not super political, but not a political, I, I, I don't know, like, uh, 
that's that's cool that that was a part of it for you. Yeah. Well, I always felt like an outcast, but I felt that my perspective was as correct as anybody's. I probably thought it was more correct than most people's outlook, but um, I don't know. I, I, I continually see so much hypocrisy and so much contradiction in the way society works and the way people uh, behave within these contexts. I don't know. There's there was kind of like a self righteousness um, that I had that is more tempered these days. But you know, when I was when I was a young man, um, I didn't want to appropriate black culture. That wasn't the point. I wasn't. My parents were actually worried. They're like, you know, a white kid, right? No, Archie Shep's blaring out of my room as a teenager, and I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, I am who I am. But I, as opposed to appropriating other people's culture, I just synthesize the influences and try to be me so you know relating to the 60s civil rights movement and black power and the black panthers and all that stuff um that's rhetorical you know it wasn't my scene um i could empathize with wanting to destroy these hypocritical structures and rebuild it um has it succeeded to some degrees but you know mm, such is the world yeah, yeah. I, I also I hear in uh, improv wise in your playing, I, I hear a lot of the Euro uh, improv guys, too. I mean, if we're talking like white or black or whatever, I mean, I hear, you know, Paul, uh, like, uh, yeah, his name, like Han Benick and that and that that sort of uh, that angle. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the area that I found inspiration in. I mean, I, I love modernism. So as you realize, Charlie, I'm into 20th century modernism and so-called <laughs> classical music, you know, whatever you want to call it, new music, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the first, you know, 1900 and 1950 rocked as far as like white guys writing notes on pages and oh, having yeah, people dude. play their awkward bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely, man. What what okay so I I am I know what you mean about when you say modernism but I'd be interested to hear you just tell folks what what that uh what you mean by that in classical music cuz I think some people might not have a sense That's a good question. I think I believe and you can you can put your two cent, cents on this when I'm done Charlie cuz I know you'll have something yeah. to say about it but um modernism in the 20th century was uh, a way of deconstructing form and trying to um, create new things that were maybe stylistically or idiomatically not precedented. I mean, it, this is, it, it's, it's kind of a theoretical um, proposition really, because everything comes out of something but I think that the hooks of modernism in the 20th century were people really trying to um, shrug off the conventions of whatever art form they were working in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that That's the kind of stuff that tends to go through my head when I hear the word modernism. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of structure. You know, I think of the idea of, like, uh, making something, like, structure and materials <laughs> and trying to make something that's not about something other than the music itself or the painting itself uh, or even the book itself. That that's, that's what I tend to think of. Yeah. Um, like non-narrative stuff. I mean, you know, if we're talking about uh, 12 tone serial yeah. composition or, you know, Xenakis, I mean, you know, these sort of, uh, yeah, music that's like structurally, you know, where the structure is, is, paramount all of my music is doing something when whenever i write a composition it's doing something specific like it's expressing some kind of idea it could be narrative or abstract but usually it's somewhat veiled and maybe not obvious to iana sinakis is one of my big big guys um you know, he's a modern composer from the 20th century that Charlie certainly knows a lot about him. I know a lot about him, but for anyone who doesn't know about him, he 
was um, he pushed music uh, very far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I um I remember around the time when I met you, I was attempting to read Zanakis's PhD thesis defense. That thing formalized music. And I remember I'm not a math guy. Yeah. And I'm certainly not a statistics and probability guy. So I was like, you know, I'm glad I'm attempting to read this. But, you know, he's explaining how his music is structured based on uh, various mathematical principles, probability. But what I did love, if I remember correctly, like they weren't pressing him on it at all. Like the P I, I remember the PhD in the dialogue. It was like the PhD panel or whatever was like just on his nuts. They were just like, how did you do this? Like, you know, like it was, he was just running the room. I don't know. I did, that that was like my only uh, takeaway. But um. Yeah, this guy's intellect is so far a great composer. He was coming from a almost like non-musical approach to making this great music. And the thing that's really important about Zanakis is how visceral his music was. It was very loud and violent. Um, he got, you know, half of his face blown off in in uh, fighting in World War II with, for the Greek resistance and this kind of shell-shocked PTSD violence um, is is orally. It can be heard in his music. It's it. That's why it's powerful to me. There's this interesting intersection between this extremely visceral music and this highly cultivated, almost alien intellect. I love it. I'm 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 a pea brain compared to Zanakis, but a boy can dream. <laughs> Yeah, well, your your compositional set. We we should get like actually specifically into what what you're doing, especially with 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 Lutenbachers and stuff. But in in a sec. But yeah, on that topic of the 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 uh, the sort of the structural or intellectual uh, abstract these things versus the visceral, um, it's really one of these things that that I, I see it as kind of really coming out of post World War II. Like you said, he gets his face blown off. People have seen all these horrors. And a lot of in a way, I almost see it as people trying to restore like reason after like something as like unreasonable as like these world wars, you know, and, and like the Holocaust and stuff. It's like or basically like you've seen the age of reason come to this like completely unreasonable point or it's just like this level of barbarism, you know, that's been under the uh, under the surface, like just blows up. So you're like. Yeah. trying to collect you're trying to collect your mind and like do something that, rational that makes sense but you're also just like fucking shell-shocked to all hell you know and the music ends up just being volcanic you know um i think all this intense music the reason why i relate to it is because i feel pretty shell-shocked as a human being um i don't know if we're gonna go that deep into my upbringing it was wasn't, can. um you know I, yeah we can't i mean but but uh i think a lot of the people that i relate to musically were just trying to cope with the human condition and the the deck of cards they were dealt um, no matter who it is and i just thought um i think it's therapeutic and i think it's constructive and that's why i've tried to vent my my urges or my, um, I don't know what to call it through just trying to be creative and trying to manifest things and trying to put my own stamp on the world, um, in some small way, I guess. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah by, by the way, just in, when you, when you said, I'm not sure how deep we, we want to get into, uh, your childhood, I, I said, we can get into it. Not, we can't. Um, we oh. can, I, I'm actually, I'm actually super well, interested maybe, in that. Maybe not today. Okay. Well, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. I mean, the, the only reason, see, I wouldn't pry, uh, but I, but it, it, it would be interesting just cause I don't know much about your upbringing. I know you're, you're from like, uh, Rockford, Illinois, sort of small, smallish town. Um, you know, like sort of America, right. You're an American. Um, but uh yeah. i, I i'm interested class. 
yeah, working class, uh, which, by the way, matters. Nobody cares about class. Everyone cares about every other fucking category on earth other than that. But in any case, don't 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 get me started. But um, but yeah, like um, what was I gonna say? Well, you're yeah, the thing, you know you're like it's interesting though because you're the, the even if you don't want to talk about your childhood, the fact that you would even bring it up and say like yeah, like you have shit that happened to you and that informs your music. I mean, even just you saying that is interesting and cool to me, having known you for so long, because your music is not, um, well, first of all, it does it's mostly instrument, it's mostly instrumental, so you're not doing like lyrics and stuff. Um, but I've never heard, you know, your stuff has never been like, I went through, this is the narrative of my life. Uh, you, you know, there's, it, it's like, uh, obviously very personally important uh, to you, but it's, it's not, uh, y you know what I'm saying? Like you haven't been putting your life and biography into this stuff in any legible way, you know? And that's where modernism comes in because I have, it's just been in an abstract way. It's not literal. It's not like this happened to me and I feel this way. As you said, it's more like, um, it's more abstract than that. It's intangible. It's, uh, of course there's a narrative in my music, but it's not, necessarily you don't need to know what the narrative is hopefully to get something out of it that's just meta text you know it's like i've always tried to shove as meta to my music as possible and whether people can get whatever layer of it they want or don't want some people don't want it at all that's all well and good but some people relate to it and i don't expect them to understand every um aspect of my music but this is where the dialogue opens and this is what's so great about art is we can project whatever we want onto it and we might be right. We might be wrong, but it's still part of the dialogue and that's what matters. Yeah. Well, you say we can project uh, uh, lots of different things onto it. I think that different music or art leaves more room for that. You know, I think there's some, there's some art that just does not leave as much room for people to project onto it, you know, and that can get very, uh, heavy handed or, or, or whatever, you know, when people are going hard line autobiographical or, you know. Yeah. I think that, you know, somebody, somebody said, no, please get started on class. Um, without making it like a huge discussion. I think that how, um, the class I came out of is very specific to my art is that I didn't have a lot of resources and I certainly did did not have a lot of encouragement. Um, and I had to, I had to manifest my art with pretty crude materials. And I still kind of stick to these simple materials because I believe that the value of the actual idea is more important than all this fucking glossy bullshit that can be piled on top of it. I, I'd rather have the core of it be something meaningful on a lot of technology or trying to do things with huge budgets or any of the shit. I just, I don't know the, the, you know, it's like when I was a kid, I never had like the cool toys that all my friends seem to have and all this shit. So I had to kind of turn inside and be more, um, involved with my own, uh, mental capacities and I had to develop my own systems and I had to create my own entertainment and uh, the cross between that and my general alienation. And that's where my music comes from. Yeah. With resources, it's a, a friend of mine said, think about it. We were, someone was talking about gear. My friend said, when have you ever gone to see a band or an act and thought to yourself, it was good, but man, I, they really should have better gear or different gear. Like you, no one ever thinks that like, that's not like, you know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Well, that's the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still struggling to have gear that works and does what I want it to do. I don't, I don't, it's not masochism on my part. It's kind of financial existential limitations, but I do think it's important to, um, do the best you can with what you've got. I mean, what, what fucking choice do you have? I don't, I don't have a lot of choice. So, yeah. um, on one hand, I'm proud that I did what I did with the modest resources I have. But on the other hand, after 30 years of doing this shit, uh, you get pretty worn down 
because it starts to look like you're banging your head against a wall. And then when blood starts pouring out, it can get a little gloomy. Um, I'm not done yet, but man, am I reassessing my own motivation? I mean, I guess I had to prove to myself I was something and I did. And now what? <laughs> Jason Wayne Sneed, Jason Wayne Sneed, by the way, is asking, uh, what's my uh, talk about Natasha Leggero. Um, somebody I went to and, um, we were almost roommates for a minute, but she's great. I haven't talked to her in a million years, but she's definitely like the 12th most famous person from Rockford. And I'm probably more like 57 or something like that. <laughs> I, I heard that you were roommates actually, but yeah, no, but, but you, you went to high school with her. Yeah. That's funny. She's pretty funny. I, I'm down with yeah, Natasha yeah. Leggero. She's, she's funnier. I, I have found her a lot funnier in person um i think she's gotten a lot funnier as as a comedian or an actress over time at first i found her a little awkward because i always thought man she was always funnier than that in person but i don't know she's kind of like created a unison for what she does she's got her persona um but man natasha's super trashy rockford i, mean, I wouldn't call her a hick i mean she's as much of a hick as i am i guess but uh um, yeah, more working class kind of stuff. So I find it ironic that she has this sort of Audrey Hepburn, like rich, snooty. That's that's a yes. there's there's a lot of irony there, and I, I that's appreciate what I that. figured. No, that's what I figured. Yeah, that's kind of what makes it funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, this thing, you know, oh this shit! By the way, it wasn't it wasn't Jason Wayne Wayne It was Andrew Climac, my my buddy from X Blank X. Hey, Andrew, how you doing? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, man. Well, just talking about talking about modernism and and class. I mean, like a lot of those. I mean, I don't know everyone's specific points of view and et cetera. But I mean, a lot of that post-war, like modernism, this stuff was not about being snooty class-wise. I mean, there was a sort of a leftism economics-wise or a Marx-ish vibe to a lot of that stuff. Luigi Nono or like, I mean, I think. I, I think part of uh, I, I think the culture of of that of like modernist stuff in like post World War Two is like a lot more uh, actually anti elitist in a way. I mean, I think there was some. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, you fully realize there is sort of a class division there. I mean, dude, the format of an orchestra, I mean, what kind of resources do you need to write music for a goddamn orchestra and have all these people play this shit? I mean, it's beyond my scope. This is why I have MIDI, you know, because I'm an orchestra. Are you kidding me? I don't have those resources, but do I need those resources? Eh, maybe it's not so relevant to what I do. You know, I'm not, not crying about it. You don't Kickstarter, dude. I did a huge large ensemble thing almost entirely from Kickstarter. But but um but uh no no, I know the um no, of of course the sort of structure of classical music always tends to be like elitist because of just the amount of money that it that it takes like for sure. But just at least like philosophically what a lot of those guys like no no were 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 dealing with was like pro uh working class or communist or something i mean there was at least this idea uh misled though it may be or whatever that that making music that is like structurally uh transcendent in its own way will be some kind of liberate liberatory project you know i think that was kind of in in the air it didn't work out very clearly but like I have to say, as far as this class thing in, in music, I think that in, in all idioms, there's a range of people working in every idiom from the rich to the poor. Uh, you know, we're, I, I was in New York for 13 years, and what I started to realize towards the end was uh, I'm a working class guy from Rockford, Illinois, and I'm actually not really wanted here. You know, I started to feel really shut out. Um, having money doesn't make you a bad person. Not not on the surface. I think that uh, the way that um, some of my peers in the scenes that I've run in um, 
some of them were cool and they had a lot of resources. Some of them weren't. And I think the ones that weren't, it's not that money makes you a bad person or having money makes you a bad person. I think it's like how they've been trained to work it, which is in New York, I saw a lot of fucking jive ass posers basically sucking up all the goddamn resources, taking all that money that they don't even fucking need. Um, I guess that compensates for the fact that nobody actually likes their fucking bullshit. So, I mean, I guess if you get this big grant, that makes you feel better about the fact that, well, I don't know, maybe you're like pretending. I don't know. Well, a lot, a lot of pretty these... uh, dark here. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's we could switch away from this, but just I mean, so much, so much of those grants are not based in class. I mean, they don't, they don't actually ask how you grew up. You know, it's like other, it's like every other. No, but I feel like, I feel like like certain people are literally trained to take all these resources, maybe the same way that their parents took all the resources, you know, from, I I don't know, this is very rhetorical, of course, but I just see an an analog there, which is um, a lot of people that don't need those resources seem hell bent on sucking all of them up. And I don't know, in a paradigm like that, that started to seem real ugly to me, like, man, I'm really not wanted here. Like I I don't, I don't have what it takes to like shuck and jive all this fucking admin and bullshit. You know, I'm trying to make music. I'm not trying to write fucking grants and all this crap. I mean, good on you if you want to do it, but well, dude, I'll tell you, man, people, let's just, let's just be haters, dude. I mean, the people in the world of experimental music, quote unquote, or whatever, contemporary music, yeah. yeah, half of these motherfuckers, man, they have the soul of a bureaucrat and the personality of like Lisa Simpson. You know, it, it's it's not <laughs> people. It's not like you know. And again, like I, I'm not saying everyone has to be. You know, I'm not saying everyone has to walk around with their face half blown off by by Nazis in order to to you know have soul or whatever. But there's like an artistic temperament. I mean, there's like it, it, you know what I'm saying. There's like uh, a lot of people are getting up without even having the vibe of an artist it's like bureaucrat shit um it's it's all case to case of course um you know i i i'm reticent as a 50 year old guy who's been through so much to paint everybody with such broad brush strokes because i think that's a bad idea but there are some generalities to be made but um my attitude is not to like have sour grapes on people who have something I think I should have or whatever. Um, I've tried to see things as I'm proud of what I did and I did the best I could. And I'm never looking at myself like, I should hide harder. Are you fucking kidding? I've always like effort. Some people make fun of that, that I'm so into like effort. <laughs> I don't know. What, who, who makes fun of that? It, well, that, that's... The- I, that's like a religion to me effort well okay Tim <laughs> this is does he <laughs> he's i'm sure he's practiced a whole lot he makes fun of well, trying. yeah i mean i love him he's my brother but that's a pose well no no here's his point which is yeah but you see well you know that tim and i roll really deep so some of this stuff is absolutely absurd it's not necessarily to be taken at face value but you know very very drunk and high at a party at about seven in the morning he turns to me and goes so a lot of people they don't like you because you're so earnest about everything and you're like really trying hard and putting a lot of work into things and you know that's that's all well and good but ultimately you know like a guy like me i'm just more popular like i don't have to try that hard and i was kind of like yeah you're right but you know we're on the same team actually but yeah we're all different <laughs> yeah man i mean Oh, Weasel got disconnected. Sad story. He'll be he'll be back in a second, I'm sure. Um I probably shouldn't be uh No, maybe I should. It it's just yeah, with the like hating on people who don't deserve it, just like hating on people for being jive in New York. It's like we both we both could go so deep. We should probably like rein it in a little bit. Um I also I want to talk to uh Oh, here he's coming back. I want to talk to the man about some current stuff he's doing, uh, flying Lutenbachers, because 
Oh, here he is. What's up, bro? You there? Could dunk the cash filled up, and it was like, you have no more credit here to talk about yourself. Oh, it's just your computer's like gagging and shit, right? Is that what it is? Oh, uh, I'm on my phone. I'm such a luddite. I'm. I mean, in some ways, I guess I was a little ahead of people with the internet and all this bullshit. But man, I am just ugh, technology and having to keep up with progress. I don't have time for this shit, man. I just got my first smartphone like a year ago or some shit like that. I was the last yeah, guy yeah. on earth with a flip phone, which is not true. I met one the other day. But, you know, I just, just like, well, why do I need this other thing? I just do this. Flip phone. Dude, that's like outsider artist level, dude. Flip phone in the 20s. That's badass, yeah. dude. <laughs> well, so... I let's, guess. Let's... But, uh, <laughs> so... Let's um let's get into flying Rootenbachers, man. Um the new the new like the return, man. Because I I honestly, you know, I was behind. I I had to catch up on um on the new records. And they're fantastic. Yeah. Fucking awesome. Um but yeah, Thanks. I mean I'm sure you've I'm sure you've talked about this in other interviews, but I want to get you to talk about it here. Uh just you know, what's different about this now? Okay. I mean, there's so many sonic similarities, but I mean, you know, I re I recently relaunched Extra Life, so I'm kind of, I've been doing all this thinking, this decision where it's like, why am I doing this? Not in the sense of doubting the decision, like, but in the sense of really analyzing, you know, what does this mean to me to bring back this project? What does the name mean? You know, when you say Flying Lutenbachers, what actually does that label mean because you got a whole new lineup right um yep. yeah you want to riff a little bit sure uh well the 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 flying lutenbachers original run was between late 1991 and 2007 and i had to walk away from the project for a while because i kept on trying to top myself in terms of complexity and as I did that, the audience seemed to not reject it, but they weren't as enthusiastic about it as I was. And frankly, I was heartbroken by that. Um, I thought we were at the top of our game and we were clearing rooms, if we could even get people. Is just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. You're in the right place at the wrong time. So I took a break. And I did a lot of other things, but I had always done a lot of things alongside it. The Flying Lutenbachers was, has always, m most of the time, been primarily my outlet for a certain aesthetic thing, which is this kind of punk modernism or whatever you want to call it, mixed with free jazz. Um, you know, after a long break, I guess it was 10 years, I was approached, I, I'd sort of been thinking about maybe trying it again, but I didn't really have the hubris. I didn't have a momentum. I was kind of doing other things. And I didn't want to do it as like cashing in on a name brand to make a few dollars or some nonsense like that. I, I guess my integrity was very clear and I had to think about uh, my motivation and, and make sure that it had some kind of purity to it as opposed to just class, like trying to cash in all, yeah. you know, cash in on what, like how much money would that right. make, Ugh, whatever. So I did four and, and it was for a good amount of money. And uh, I figured, well, that's a good reason to get the band back together. So I did, I did this tour with Tim Dahl and asked what I thought was a classic material. And I found out that I was bored as fuck um, playing that shit, and it seemed like going through the motions to me. So yeah. I kind of put it back down for a while because I didn't want to become a repertory group, you know, playing all the hits or whatever. Uh, it just wasn't where I was at. So uh, I thought about it, and then our, my buddy John Dwyer from the OCs came along a couple, of, like a year and a half later, and he said, "Hey, buddy, OCs are playing three nights at Warsaw in Brooklyn." Uh, 
you got anything you want to put on it? And I was like, yes, I do. I have the flying loot markers. And he said, well, why don't you open all three shows? And I went, okay, God damn it. Somebody's forcing me to do this again. So, you know, we got a new group together and at first it was sort of, uh, I would call this kind of like harmonic punk thing, largely based improvisation. It wasn't super structural because I was trying to figure out like where this thing was going and what I really wanted to do with it. And we put out two double albums in 2019 and then expanded the group. Uh, I actually switched to guitar. I don't play drums in the group anymore, which is um, maybe surprising to some adherents, but maybe not shocking. Uh, and we made two more records since then. And I moved back to Chicago, permanently in november and you know i already had my sights on starting a new group and uh alex per call up who was in the group 20 years ago is the first repeat flying lutenbacher he's playing bass i have this great drummer charlie werber on drums and i'm playing guitar so it's like we're getting back to like stripped down composed chaos right now you know it's not going to be as rehearsal intensive as maybe the most complex flying lutenbarger stuff but i can't make it dumb i literally can't at this point like i, <laughs> oh, I yeah. i'm writing songs for these guys and i think i'm making them easy like dumbing them down no i i'm literally incapable of doing it and i'm sitting here learning these guitar parts and i'm like jesus christ dude what are you doing to yourself like you got to practice this shit all the time like you i thought this was the easy stuff but oh, so and, i mean there's yeah. always going to be some kind of twist where i'm Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, yeah. It's crazy because I I met you when you I think when Lutenbachers was at the most composed, like Infection and Decline, and then especially Systems Emerge, yeah. was like <laughs> it's it's funny. I I I thought of you as primarily that, like uh, and and at free mm -hmm. improv and free jazz were like an influence, but I thought of them as more of like just this earlier thing of the Lutenbachers. And then when you broke up Lutenbachers the first time, it's like it seemed like you just went full on with like free jazz uh, mode, and it's like it seemed like it really was working. I know you you expressed career dissatisfactions, but like I don't know, like I I I, re I feel like over the past decade, I was like, damn, Weasel's like really doing it as like a free jazz drummer, you know? I made a record with like Roscoe Mitchell, dude. That's like it's, yeah, it's like shoulders of giants, shit, man, you know? So. I mean, uh, that worked out as far as, you know, like a phase. It's... I have to say that I've had pretty good luck, hashtag blessed, um, of working with people out of my record collection. And yeah. I think that just had to do with my stick to it, to itiveness and my consistency. And maybe, you know, if people, some people get along with me famously, um, some don't uh needless to say um you know that's a matter of uh, uh you know aesthetics once again i think but um you know really i have to give credit where credit's due i had kind of turned my back on improvised music for a long time because in chicago i didn't like what was going on there and i was also um i was kind of an cast there as far as that music went so i kind of like turned my back on it and then when i moved to oakland california in 20 2003 um, I did like rock stuff there, loot mockers, XBX or X, all this kind of other shit. Oh, yeah. And then after a couple of years, this guy, Damon Smith, this double bass player who is a hardcore improviser, maybe he's one of paper. the, you know, he's one of the few people that focuses entirely on improvised music. Like he doesn't do composed shit. Like it doesn't, yeah. it's not a thing. Um, he basically was like, Hey, hey, motherfucker! Uh, you're in you're in Oakland now. You want to play some gigs? And basically, I, I have to blame him for my my second wave free jazz uh, <laughs> impulse because he basically threw me into all these awesome playing situations uh, with you know like top tier European improvisers and all the cool people that were in that scene at that point. And you know, like I, I got to play with. Evan Parker. I got to play with Roscoe Mitchell. I mean, I got to play with Hell yeah. tons of my great peers also. I mean, a million of those, like Peter Evans, uh, you know, all these motherfuckers. Like, I did have a good run. Um, that shit's not super happy, but then, you know, things go up and down. When the next wave comes, I'll be there. Maybe I won't. Maybe, maybe I won't care. You know, I did a solo drum gig last night that was free improvised, and it was, you know, I did a single 22-minute piece. Um, 
I don't particularly like drum solos, which is why I take the challenge every now and then, because it's it, like drum solos. Most drum solos are not music to me. They're like technical yeah. displays. And the yeah. challenge is to try to make that into some kind of actual music. That's almost like the hardest thing for me to do, but that's kind of free improvisation at its core. Yeah. 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 There's such a, um, I mean, it seems like there's a really vibrant free, free jazz thing in New York happening right now, like with people, uh, like in their twenties, um, you know, just the sort of, uh, you know, I mean, like Luke Stewart and, 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 uh, and the sort of, uh, astral spirits yeah. label and that whole thing. There's, there, well, there's that uh, what's that? Luke Stewart, he's kind of closer to our generation. Um, oh, okay. Well, that's there's scene, some though, stuff you know. going on. There, there are all these stuff going on. I feel like my wave of, of improvisers in New York really just got disemboweled by the epidemic and never came back. So now it's the time for these 20-something improvisers to kind of take over and do their thing. It's all well and good. Uh, I haven't really been too blown away by anything i've seen or heard but you know that's the journey that's you know they can do whatever they want um i don't know i guess i'm a critical person and i'm probably going to stop before i piss a bunch of people off that are listening to this ah, but ah, i'm into brutal death metal i mean that's what i listen to <laughs> yeah 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 i mean there's not i'm into yeah, death metal i don't really listen to other shit i just don't care you know no, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, the general, the general free imp improvised music scene that I'm referring to is not too big on devourment or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, um, I mean, I don't know, like any anything that's like vaguely related to what I'm into, though, that's like happening. I, you know, I, I mean, I just, I miss New York so much, dude. I fucking miss New York so much. L.A. I do it every stream. I complain, but um. I'm moving back next year, actually, so so it'll be cool. Uh, me and my me and my girlfriend, but um, I mean, yeah, New York never dies, though. There's always ups and downs and 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 stuff. And so it seems to me one of the things that's on the up there is free improvised music, even if you're saying you're not really blown away by any particular part of it, you know. I think to be more nuanced about this discussion, each generation is going to have its own aesthetic and its own motivations, and my motivations for playing improvised music come out of these influences that we talked about earlier and particularly the revolutionary and chaos aspects of 60s and 70s free jazz i'm not sure it almost seems like a lot of the new improvisers in new york are influenced by like expensive makeovers they had at liberal arts colleges where they're like and now you're an improviser go out and get a bunch of grants and play fucking tedious bullshit and act like it's really great i'm uh, you know i'm this is another w wide stroke right here but this could just be old fogeyism on my part like weasel doesn't get it like i don't know whatever it's fine <laughs> well even if there's an ingredient of that uh you are correct or no i we i agree <laughs> let's put it that way um but yeah. um but I mean, as far as so like, but like new Lutenbacher stuff, man, it's like you you are going back to the composed stuff, though, to an extent. I mean, it may not be like it may not be on the on the level of complexity that like, uh, it, you know, those early 2000s records were. But I mean, like you said, it's mm -hmm. it's it's being complex. And I uh, I'm you know what I'm interested in, like, where do you have a sense of where you're trying to have this shit land? You know, because like back in the day, flying Lutenbachers, like you said, you, you you were getting more and more complex and more and more modernist, and you were saying it was kind of alienating some of the people in the sort of punk-ish realm, the no wavy realm. Um, but at least you knew where it was where it was gonna function. I mean, you were clearing rooms, but you knew what rooms you were gonna be clearing. Like it was that world, the DIY punk underground no wavy mm -hmm. kind of world. Uh, do, are you kind of just like with Lutenbachers, man? I mean, are you just now planning on just dropping right back into like playing clubs, maybe not sleeping on couches and doing less touring, but the same kind of touring? Or are you trying to just get on some different place to drop that? You know what I mean? I think that 
it's important with these things not to put the cart before the horse. And the next phase of the Lutenbachers is very concerned with being a good, well-rehearsed band where everyone's on the same page. And um, that's really important to me. I feel like what I need to say right now is happens to be largely composed um, just because that's what I want to do. The Lutenbachers has always been... It's uh, which whichever way the wind has blown with me, I've followed it. You know, if it fits my austere criteria, we more improvised music. Felt at that point, we had to do improvised music, and right now, I want to do. I'm really influenced by death metal so strongly, and I listen to it so much right now. I guess I'm just attracted to just having these really tight compositions. But at the same time, I'm into not making them so idiomatic and at the same time i don't want them to be so complicated that we're gonna fucking reverse our asses off and then go on stage and and slip on banana peels playing this shit because um the commitment's different when you get older you know when you're younger you're ready to go all in on this bullshit and starve for it and then when you're 50 and you've starved for 30 years you get kind of like <laughs> uh there's gotta be another way to do this so yeah reassessing the thing has been very crucial right now and also to answer your question, where do I think I'm going with it? I don't know. The music comes first. Um, uh, we, in the last, since 2017, we haven't played that many gigs. We did two European tours. I would love to do another European tour. I don't see touring America because, frankly, I think uh, uh, people have their heads up their fucking asses culturally. And I don't even think that most people would give this band the time of day. But, you know, that's... I was any different from any preceding era. You know, my attitude was always like, I have this aesthetic. I am doing this. It's like, if you fucking like it, yay, come on board. And if you don't like it, <laughs> goodbye. You know, I, I don't yes, know. I guess I'm yeah. a little indignant about it, which is I want to do what I want to fucking do. And, and, you know, obviously it's more fun and better if there's an audience, but man, I just, I'm committed to doing this art. Yeah, man. I, I mean, Europe, yeah, like at Extra Life, we booked a European tour first. We're going out in January. Um, and yeah, I, I would love to play the States, just but but I but I wouldn't love. I mean, there's no plan to do it. There's absolutely no plan. I mean, I, I think what, you know, it can be rough, I think, for doing somewhat esoteric music or stuff like we're doing. It's like you could, in the States, there are probably people in these towns that love what you're doing, but like might just not come to the show, you know, or like people who seriously are like into your shit, but would just miss the show or not buy merch if they came like, you know what I mean? Where it's just like, I feel like if I go to France, it's like, even if there's just yeah. like 15 people in the town that like us, they will definitely be there and they will definitely buy a bunch of shit. And it's like, you know, hopefully it's more than 15 people, but you know, it's sort of, mm -hmm. uh, the states it's hard to even tell like what's yeah how how the gigs are even going to go you know totally. i mean i've kept track of all my gigs and since 1992 i've played almost 2500 gigs and i've eaten a lot of shit you know i've i've had some glory but you know i've i've definitely had some pretty rough stretches where um you know the conditions were not very uh favorable or dignified and that was a means to an end. Um, I'm reassessing this now because it's like, well, where did that get me? I mean, I made a lot of cool stuff and <laughs> what else is there? You know, like I got to like pay my rent and shit and I'm not getting any younger. Or so it's not motivated by money. It's never the motivation, but man, you got to fucking eat. You got to like pay your bills somehow. Um, I don't have any like hidden money around, you know, to, um, cruise on so you know um what was i going to say uh viability is an interesting thing especially when you get older um you're uh, you know i'm not exactly the bell of the ball these days uh in many places but you know like the thing about america is this okay like cellular chaos a uh, rock band that i had um and still kind of have right now we we're like, we're going to tour the States and we're going to like make this happen. And it was like, we did a lot of touring and we did it pretty rough and we did three tours. And the growth I saw in the three tours were 
okay, we can get 15 to 30 people in every town and this is going like fucking nowhere. You know, we're like middle-aged people that are getting paid like 75 bucks a night or a hundred bucks to like play to 15, 30 people. You know, if they like it, great, but man, there's no fucking growth. How long can we do this? We had a drummer that was in his sixties, you know, it's like, I always thought that was <laughs> he amazing, had to yeah. fucking leave after a certain point. Yeah. 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 I mean, whatever, you know, so, I mean, there's, there, you know, I can only do so much, God damn it. You know, and I feel like I've got done a lot considering uh, how back been against the wall the whole fucking time. Almost, you know, no frill I've ever done and touring with Lydia Lunch because she is committed to making her band happy and having fun and kind of like rolling up the carpet. So, I mean, I'm not going to act like it's all gloom and doom. Like every single gig I played is like self flagellation but man kind of at this point it is kind of seeming like that so i have to i have to um address this i mean i, I talked to this about my therapist today he's like man you know like uh if there's no joy in this and it just seems like a slog you gotta you gotta reassess this shit because what, what are you doing this for you're gonna like keep doing this and being like miserable for another 10 20 years and it's kind of like that's a great question, man. You know, like, you, you know, me, like I'm a TMI guy. Like I don't hold back. I kind of, I don't play this diplomacy shit. Like, yeah, everything's great. I'm at the top of my game. My career is going fabu, fabu. <laughs> yeah, you know, some shit's going on. It's not like the greatest time, but, um, you know, there's always questions, you know, and you gotta be real about it. I'm, I'm you know, I, it's, it's not the end of the line or anything, but it's again, to assess what's going on. Well, man, I, I mean, I think that it's it's healthy for everyone. Well, it's for people. I think it's healthy for people who decided at an early age, who decided like I'm doing this, when it wasn't even a decision. Where you're just like, I am this guy. This is what I'm doing for my entire life. I think it's healthy to be able to just be like, I could just quit music. I mean, I'm not going to, but it's like I I have the option. And it's it's I've said this before. It's kind of like a suicidal thought but like in a good way where you're just like i'm gonna live but i i could kill myself like i don't have to even do this next rehearsal like you know uh you know but just as an artist i could kill my art like um i don't know that can be freeing i i i think i don't know i mean uh does that shit cross your mind like literally just like uh not suicide i mean well that too but i mean does it cross your mind to just be like i'm gonna quit music and just do some completely other thing and then maybe come back to it when I'm 80 or maybe not. No, um, that's, the, that's the struggle. That is exactly the struggle is that I don't want to do anything else. I wish I did. I might go fucking do it, but man, I, I don't want to do anything else. I mean, this is another thing I talked today about. It's like my, my sense of vitality is, is really wrapped up in being performing live and doing this, this action, you know, and, and pouring my soul into it. And if I'm not playing, I, I, I'm like, I have it as nowhere to go. And it's, it's really tough um, to deal with. So now it's like, well, what am I going to do? You know, like how much bullshit am I going to keep putting up with to do this thing that I think I need to do so bad? Like, I don't know, man. You know, like I don't just sit and I make great records all day. Like that's not the point of this. I am, uh, I can be witty and charming, but I'm pretty antisocial alienated person. And I kind of need these social interactions of band members and audience people and like people hanging out to draw me into the fucking world, man. Cause I could disappear down a wormhole. So that's, I guess that's what I'm a little scared about is um, yeah. Like when all is said and done, there's so much competition and culture that, you know, unless if you're one of these gilded people that everyone just fucking loves, which I'm not one of those people, it's easy for you to just fucking disappear and like everyone's like no nobody's fucking talking about you and you're not getting any opportunities so part of my next phase of the last 30 years is just i knew everything was going to fail so i tried to keep as many balls in the air as possible so i could always have these opportunities and vistas to go down and i don't feel like i necessarily have as many balls in the air right now so i don't know you know i'm, I'm not like uh, I'm not ready to give up. I mean, I still have things I want to express and I think they're fairly unique and I think there's an audience for it. Um, you know, it's just about reassessment and being realistic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, do you think about just going though in a direction? I mean, we, we talked about like uh, the the world of like uh, you know applying for grants and fellowships and this kind of you know institutional funding. I mean. I know why you don't want to do that because it's the same reason why I don't like doing that. And I've gone in waves of doing it and getting like tiny things, but mostly not. And then like returning to it, I keep sort of putting off, you know, I'm just like, okay, when I yeah. really slow down, probably into my forties, then I'm going to start just doing that bureaucrat shit or like trying to, you know, um, I mean, I'm surprised you just aren't even like that. That's not even vaguely on the table for you, because I mean, given that you are like a composer, I mean, this is not a, you know, it's not a should thing at all. But I just remember when when I first got to know you and I was like, damn, OK, systems emerge and all this com compositional stuff. I kind of assumed I'm like, yeah, like this guy is going to just be like writing string quartets and going down that kind of road of, um you, you, you know, like in funded shit, you know what I mean? Like acad academic's not the right word because I'm not talking about necessarily through a school, but you know what I'm saying? Institutionally funded. Yeah. I mean, you could be grabbing that shit. I, you just have to have some way to describe it that makes it sound like, <laughs> like not just like super yeah. negative, you know? Yeah, my buddy Andy Ortman is trying to push me towards some Illinois shit because I, I have a feeling there's, for a guy like me, um, there might be more funding in Illinois than there is in New York um, because there's fucking less competition, honestly. Yeah. And that's all well and good. You know, I may, I may look into some of these things, but, you know, honestly, all I need the money for is to like fucking eat and pay my rent. I don't, I don't need, I don't have any like huge plans. I mean, I, I like playing in bands, you know, I like, I like stripped down things where it's real, you know, it's like simple gear people learning the shit, people getting inside of it, people getting a vibe um, by working on this material or whatever the, the nature of the band is. And um, that's what's important to me. Like, I don't have any big aspirations right now. Like, I need to write a fucking symphony piece or a large ensemble piece or anything. I, I do those. I get a fire under my ass every once in a while, and, and I do those things. But in a weird way, it's not satisfying. Well, it's less satisfying to me than having a small group. With the small group, there's at least this constant momentum of like, yeah, yeah we got to practice. We got to write more shit. And with like a big piece, it's like, you know, I've, I, I, I've done big band works and stuff like that. And at the end, I'm kind of like, okay, well, you know, some people came. It was pretty good. It got recorded. Next. <laughs> you know, I don't like that feeling really. Yeah, so when you can't tour, I, I when you focus can't tour with some groups yeah. because I think there's a, like a tribal thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Don't know. Yeah, no, I, I feel it. I like bands. Um, I'm old fashioned. I like rock. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There, dude, driving, I mean, if the money is good enough and the, you know, and there's accommodations and shit, I am still totally into driving seven hours and playing to like not a ton of people totally still down with that if the money's okay then that's europe yeah. i mean that's what europe is you know it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. what's some like i mean i mean I, I, sorry. you know i've been i've i've played to big, big audiences and i've played to small audiences you know more small than big uh when i'm on stage it's showtime man i'm not looking at i'm not counting the fucking people much I'm going off I'm damage i'm not there to like feel important or some bullshit like that i really don't care that's not why I do it you know yeah so but at the same time you know like it's it's a thing to, to take time off of work and go play your goddamn music for nobody and not get paid you know what i mean it's like that's kind of pretty big like <laughs> you know that's, that's real shit you know yeah no indeed what are you are you I, I didn't know you were doing a day job now i thought you were you were just uh actually just playing me yeah, you doing a day job thing? well you know like i said i put 20 balls in the air and i've always been juggling them it sucks man it's me basically like under my mask going, I hate this band. I hate everyone in here. God damn it. I'm getting 18 bucks an hour for this shit. I'm not, uh, you know, it's like kind of not worth my time, but I thought I'd <laughs> check it out. Um, I do a lot of shit, man. I mean, I, I master people's records. I run my own yeah, label. I do mail order. Uh, you know, I do all this shit 
expected to make ends meet. Um, it's, it's modest. That's for sure. I don't think anyone who looks at me and says, Hey, this guy makes a living making music. I want to do that too. Slow down a little bit <laughs> before you like jump into that shit. Um, I don't know if it seems glamorous. It's, it's definitely not. Yeah. My career was driven by my mania. It wasn't driven by me collecting checks and, you know, like, you know, going over the finish line with, with a bouquet of roses. So, you know, I don't know. It's yeah, been, yeah. it's been grim you know, lots of times, but I've also gotten a lot of glory. I've played a lot of great music with a lot of great people and I've had crazy fucking experiences and I've met awesome people I've played to like insane shows. I've done all kinds of shit. So when it's worth it, you know, there's all this struggle and shit, but like I got to do incredible fucking things and those aren't laurels to rest on, but I have to remind myself that I did everything I set out to do, whether or not it was like super fucking hard and it's getting harder. I did it, you know, like, and, and there's part of me that gives myself a break now on this shit, which is like, you dude, should, man. what do you, what do you think it is? <laughs> you know, like you made 250 records, you played 2,500 shows, you played with some of your idols. Like, okay, man, you did it. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. That's um, yeah, I that's I've been getting to that same point recently. Just this kind of gratitude for the first half, the first half of life. You know, feeling like it at least makes sense. Yeah. You know, it may not be everything you thought it was going to be when you were 11, but it's uh, yeah. Um, well, man, like we nah, should get into, it was uh, actually kind of, except for mass it, popularity, but, you know, it's exact. You could have predicted it kind of, this. My life has been crazy, dude. My life has been fucking crazy. Like I can't even, I can't even, I'm still like parsing what my life has been. Ultimately, I mean, Oh God. I do want to do a shout out real quick. Cause Brenna's out there and her band bleeders is really awesome. And she's a great guitar player and she's kind of representing like the younger people who are like, keep going grandpa. And, and thanks Brenna. Thanks to people like you that um, are coming up and, and get it, you know, like keep, keep fucking fight the fight, you know? Okay. Bleeders you know, fight you the fight. It, Somebody's got to fight it. Yeah. 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 Bleeders. Sick. Great band um, from uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, from uh, yeah, from Mass. Okay, sick. Well, you know what I'm interested in, man. That we've like. Do you have any stuff to to like? I mean, how nerdy do we want to get into with like actual technical compositional stuff? Because on these streams, it's like always a balance. It's like sometimes it's like oh culture, like how it fits into culture. But then sometimes I'm like, man, you know, I, I some people do want to hear you talk about. I, you know, like how you write this stuff, um, because it sounds the complexity. It doesn't sound like the kind of thing where you just turn on the faucet and then there's some stuff. I mean, it, 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 it is very considered obviously what you're doing. And I know you do stuff where you have like, a, um, or maybe I'm wrong, but I've heard you talk about how you like start off with like a little set of notes and then, you know, a pitch set or something and then develop it or do things, you know, uh, 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 yeah. you know, take lines and like uh, restructure them and do them backwards and retrograde. Uh, are you well, maybe let me ask, is the current Lutenbacher stuff on that vibe, like with how you're making it? Yes, but I want to say I misidentified Brenna. It's the other Brenna. Hi, Brenna. Um, it's not Brenna from Bleeders, but Bleeders is a great band. But uh, hi, Brenna. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the, the brain cells don't work so great. Okay, so the, the writing for the Flying Lutenbachers is usually um, every composition is based on some grain of an idea that I want to express. Um, and it could be a really abstract thing, or it could be just some riff or melodic thing that I like that I want to explore. But usually there's some kind of narrative to it. Like my, a new song that I wrote that we're working on now, I kind of wanted to write a thrash metal song. Of course, it's not going to sound like your uncle's thrash metal, uh, duh, you know, but that was sort of like a short for, well, I wanted to be like fast and do this and this. So I started writing the, the beginning of it and it had this sort of like, you know, when they have a riff and they sort of like start and stop, like building up to the actual, like where the riff comes in. I realized that yes. I just wanted to have the whole song be just that intro 
with like the, the accents and all that shit. So it's it's like basically like the beginning of a thrash song that never starts for five minutes. <laughs> yes. You know, that's the narrative right there. Right. It's like, that's the joke, you know? So right, I, I right, often right. get like really, you know, some of my best music is jokes. It's kind of like an in-joke of, you know, it's this really simple idea that's almost laughable and I made this crazy thing out of it. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the games that I like to play. It's like the meta text. It's what I call the meta text of the compositions and shit. So, yeah, that that's a really that thing about the starting of the thrash song is that's really funny to hear, man. Because that's yeah, like there's often right. there's often some new musicy contemporary musicy kind of things where I'm like, yeah, I'm like, if the band did just this, it would be Stockhausen yeah. or something, you know. But um. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. sick. But so, but so 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 like it'll be a clear idea like that. But you're you're not dealing with stuff like I mean I think in the past you like do some stuff where you have like a melody and then you like take parts of it and do something else. I mean, are you are you dealing with like that level of of sort of like um an- analness? Of course, that makes it sound bad when I, of course we know it's good. But um like uh. Like, are you dealing with like process, like on that level, or like as far as like notes and rhythms, you're writing that stuff more like intuitively now, or it depends on what the end goal is. Uh, I obviously, as you realize, I have very specific tastes in terms of rhythmic and harmonic material, and probably timbre material also all three so yeah. there are built-in limitations right there there's almost some rule you know like already just because i i have my set material um it really ah uh, you're, you're breaking it up a lot is now. it you know because i want what to express a certain thing okay Ooh, any better? We, uh, there you are. Is it better? Okay. Yeah. Better? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, so now, now I hear you. A lot of times, okay. A lot of times, the compositions are serving the goal of whatever ensemble they're being done with. Um, in the case of the new Ludenbacher stuff, I'm really influenced by, uh basically the entire 1970 run of the band, the who like the, them live at their peak where they were sort of accidentally awesome for one year. And <laughs> I'm really into electric light orchestra and I'm really into brutal death metal. So the next phase of the Lutenbachers is kind of based on my fetishes. Does that make sense? Like I get, yes. I get in little modes where I like certain things and then I want to expand on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I noticed you were getting like, like you were going really hard on like uh, Poison Idea, like really hard on Facebook on Poison Idea for a little yeah. bit, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, they're a good band. I just, but yeah. you know, it was kind of just like, okay, Weasels. Yeah, and the result was I did a twenty-minute variation in a Poison Idea song. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, but so no, this is okay. Like, but that's that's cool to hear because it's like, so yeah, you're saying like, um, you don't. You, you get on these yeah these hyper focused things but they're not uh hyper focused in that in that level of like a couple of notes and like you know that kind of thing like you're kind of saying your tastes your taste in melody and harmony and rhythms is like so particular anyway that it's like automatically very limited like you don't have to uh yeah it's it's yeah yeah i feel that um do you work with notation? I'll nowadays? let a little secret out, which is I often write. Oh, you're getting you're getting garbled. The connection, okay. the secret. I often write secret. from archetypes. From archetypes. Oh, man. Tell me when it sounds like. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I write from archetypes. Still shitty. Yeah. Yeah. So check la 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 la. It's okay. It's pretty in and out, but I mean, you know, we can keep can keep trying. Uh, yeah. So you write music based. Okay, on, I'll so talk what do you mean? Slow. Yeah. How do you mean archetypes? Like, what's the what are we what are we talking here? 
what I mean is, what I mean is, I am I'm a voracious listener of music, and I process a lot of it, and I analyze it, and I analyze what I like about a lot of music, and sometimes it's these small little things that happen in music that inspire me. It could be literally one chord change in one song or something crazy like that. It seems so ineffectual, but to me, it's it's an avenue, it's a motif to explore. So um, a lot of times, like, I, okay, here's a very concrete example. About a year and change ago, I got super obsessed with The Who live in 1970 when they were at their peak of being this insane fueled by drugs, awesome, epic rock band. And I don't really like The Who very much otherwise. I think they kind of stink, actually. But um, they were accidentally good for one year. And I was watching them at Isle of Wight, and they come out of the gates roaring with this amazing song, Heaven and Hell, that was written by John Entwistle. And it's a very cynical song about there basically being no God. And the chord progressions are amazing, and the energy is amazing. And I look at that and I go, heaven and hell, how can I expand on this? How can I make this feeling mine? What can I do? You know. So and then I try to get to the middle of it and tinker with it and take it apart and put it back together. And by the time I put it back together, it doesn't resemble the original thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing when you're like uh, when you're just kind of a, a naturally iconoclastic um, artist. It's like you can actually just decide to try to like replicate something and it ends up being original anyway. You don't have to like try to make it original. It's just like, it's just going to be your own thing, you know? Um, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, this, I mean the who I wouldn't, I wouldn't totally expect, but I could like, you know, I can, I can, I can kind of see it. Um, we, we, we actually, which piece was that or which song was that? Or like what, which project is that a Lutenbacher's thing? chaos our last show we opened with heaven and hell but our twist on it was that we used all 12 keys so <laughs> the the song already had some some gravity to the harmonic changes but we ours and making it even more extreme so so this is the outlook right like take something and pervert it make it more psychedelic more insane um yeah. improve on it and make it yours you know so yeah 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 there's that i'll tell you what but i like thing... a big of rave up. i like i like the cool endings of songs that go on and on and i i often want to like capture that kind of momentum so sometimes i'm writing like the codas the awesome codas to other people's awesome songs and making it a full song in and of its own nice how um i my recent well, yeah. it's an old, it's an old obsession of mine, but it keeps coming back every few years. Uh, and I'm now in the cycle of coming around yet again to just being only listening to like New York hardcore. Like, that's it. Like just the past, the past month, it's been like almost nothing but just New York hardcore. How are, are you into, New, what New York hardcore bands are you into? At any, at all? What's your, what's your relationship? Because I know you're no wave to the core, Lydia Lunch to the core, that scene to the core, but what what about the other what about the other i think as far as hardcore goes i'm probably more into west coast shit overall and i don't know like the new york thing not not quite my cup of tea i've ex explored it um it's definitely more busted out and brutal than a lot of the other contemporary shit it's like I think a lot of the New York hardcore had zero resources. Like they're literally That's doing this I'm stuff thinking. with yeah. like the worst year of all time, basically. And like no finesse, like no lessons, just like really like punching it out. Yeah. Um, the early shit. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in the eighties. I grew up in the eighties and a lot of my friends were into the hardcore scene. I was always kind of a little outcasty. I was into seventies punk and then no wave and free jazz and all that kind of crap. So I was kind of like weird, yeah. more arty kind of focused like original punk and i didn't really relate to hardcore at the time i my cat's saying hello to me i didn't really relate to hardcore at the time but i reassessed it at some point during the 2000s and i found a lot of cool things that i 
I like, like Poison Idea and Negative Approach and Decroitson's yes. early stuff and all these negative things. approach, man. Um, ne- negative approach you know, is, is the one that that uh, yeah. that influenced so much New York hardcore. I mean, that you know, even though they're Midwestern, that was they they were really yeah. picking up on that. But uh, yeah, I didn't think you were a big hardcore dude, yeah. but I'm just like interested, you know. Um, Um, my taste is pretty felicitous, as you know, like if something catches my ear, I kind of don't really care what it is uh, in terms of the context or idiom. Um, uh, you know, I get fixated on weird things about music. Like I have this deep love for electric light or orchestra that it's probably like a head scratcher to some and to other people. It's so painfully obvious. Yeah. that I really like bomb bath. Yeah, well, we've we've talked about glam yeah. shit a little bit and and stuff like Adam and the Ants. You know, I know you like love you love Adam Ant. I uh, we talked about him a bunch. That's the other side, not modernist composition, right? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that. I'm a Midwestern rock and roll boy. I grew up listening to FM radio and rock and I was a punk early on, stuff like that. So there's, you know, for all of my uh, intellectual conceits, there's still this kind of get your hands dirty um, intensity that I think I try to represent. Um, I maybe call it bloody minded. You know, I like to get my hands dirty. I like to dig in and, sweat and and push things around uh walk the line of chaos Mm -hmm. yep yep i you know here's a question actually that that i ask myself a bunch and i ask other people and it actually applies to my my uh just what i think about this entire youtube channel and project i'm like does it i mean do you ever feel like your music is musicians music and if you do, like, how do you feel about that? Because I've, I've embraced that most of my fans are musicians. That used to bug me. Now I'm just like, it is what it is. Um, but, you know, like, yeah, like, like free jazz and modernist composition, mostly people who listen to that are musicians. Punk not as punk not as much it's more open you know uh yeah how do you see your your stuff landing with that like i have an opinion on this and uh this might not be popular but i'm going to put out there i think that the general music illiteracy of especially modern americans hinders their ability to actually hear great music i think they're fucking stupid and they haven't put in the time and work that it takes to hear music. They want sort of like this instant gratification or identifying with a scene or some kind of like clothing style or some bullshit like that. That's all well and good. That's fun. But like, you know, my music being musicians music, it is by default because I guess people just have shit in their ears and they just can't hear it. They need like, like a cute, person like in front with shaking their ass or whatever i don't don't care i mean i like that stuff too but you know um if you can't hear music then what are you what are you going to music for like what they look like and what they meant that's all well and good but that's not why i'm in music i mean i'm in music because it sounds awesome and makes me feel things don't know what to say you know i think musical illiteracy is a huge problem yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So right, so so right. Like you're not trying to make musicians' music, and you you're feeling like it's kind of sad that only musicians have the sort of musical literacy to feel what you're doing. But if but if their culture were kind of different, people who don't play instruments would still be able to vibe with what what you're doing. Is that kind of because that's kind of how I think sometimes. Like, yeah. I mean, I I don't assume that everyone that listens to my music is is a music and gets it on some kind of high fluting structural level or something like that. I mean, I, I've met plenty of people who are just like, whoa, what is that? Cool. And that's great. That's great when you make that connection. But I think overall, um, I don't particularly like a lot of contemporary music because I just think it lacks the the elements that I find interesting in music. And because a lot of it seems so utterly dumbed down to the point of 
just bland nothingness. I don't, I don't get it. So the mainstream I pay like pop music, I pay zero fucking attention to that shit. Zero attention, no interest whatsoever. That shit mm. sucks. Like it's for, <laughs> it's for like people who have a, like a vacation on a boat or some shit. I don't know who the fuck that shit is for. It's, it's just jive. So I just do my own thing. It's fine. There's like, yeah. I, I think like even more than uh, even more than harshness of sound or like dissonance or noisiness or complexity of material. I think what what really makes things challenging for people to listen to is just form the vibe of like having music where you're like, I don't know what's going to happen next, you know, because if you listen to anything, it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be pop music. It could be punk or yeah. just rock and roll like there's going to be a verse chorus verse chorus maybe some kind of breakdown thing at the end you know it's like i I feel like that's when you go away from when you depart from that that's when things become like challenging musically i think just when when it's when you have to follow a form that's just like someone composed it you know i think that pop music took a lot more weird chances compositionally in the past because there wasn't this dumbed down law that it's got to be in one key. You know, if there's like this one guy that writes all the pop songs now, he's like Dr. Luke or whatever his fucking name is. He's like this like scientist that has the same Pro Tools template and just plugs shit in. It's like so, so crafty. It's like that's just like pure commercialism. And honestly, the chord progressions aren't good. There's no, there's no gravity in the music most of the time it's about arrangements and like making everything as slick and possible it's almost like um like a flashing light something you know this that's the attraction is all kind of like jingling bells and bullshit like that i mean if you don't like the style then there's literally nothing left there for you uh, and i don't like the style the music is fucking threadbare nonsense so i mean what's left i don't like the style i don't like, like the music goodbye nothing left i don't know <laughs> yeah 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 well Pop used yeah. to be more experimental i'm sorry well, you know, I think that I think there used to be. Uh, I, I think now there's actually more like people do research on what melodic figures release dopamine and stuff like that, and like rhythms that that release. I mean, there's actually like focus, like scientifically dialing shit in, you know, which is like different than some guy. Uh, some guy just trying to imagine like what would people like like even though it's trying to please the the masses it's still like at least a human uh creative interpretation of what they think like most people would be into so you get some interesting stuff along the way but now now there's a lot of like research going on uh which is kind of kind of nuts a lot of this shit is random i never really made music to appeal to some um status quo or some scene or something like that i mean sometimes my music fits into a scene but it's never made to be like "Ooh, this band is popular i'm gonna make this that's kind of why i'm not in like a legit metal band because there's too many of those like there's no re it's redundant there's no reason for me to make a metal band like there's one real band and they're all pretty good to awesome i mean the two and it's like hundreds I'm doing one sentence reviews and letter grades for each thing so I can keep track of all these bands. They're, they're almost interchangeable, you know? Um, can't, I don't want to be redundant. It, I just don't want to do dude, that. It, dude, death metal is so fucking crazy. Black metal to an extent, but death metal in particular, at least my perception, I don't even try to keep up that much. But the number of death metal bands that are like pretty good or higher is unreal i mean i i don't think there's that many death metal bands that are like earth shatteringly profound but as far as like c-list shit that like i would listen to and be like dude there's some stuff in here it's it's endless i mean as far as a genre of music that's almost like the highest success rate i mean would you agree with this i mean this is absolutely the bar is extremely high i mean there's a lot of people that consider me to be like this great drummer and you know maybe in some senses i would maybe agree with them but i also think that when i hear even like mediocre death metal drummers i can't fucking do what they do like and i'm They're actually like kind of trying to yeah. do what they do and i'm not succeeding at it it's pretty 
<laughs> you know, it's like these people are, oh, are utterly fucking sick. Someone's mentioning in Senate, um, uh, which is uh, improvised death metal band uh, from Columbus, Ohio. Ha ha ha. And the drummer looks a lot like me and he plays a lot like me. But um, that shit is like a different thing. That's me. That's us basically looking at brutal death metal and going, um, well, if if it's like so rehearsal intensive and it winds up sounding so atonal, why don't we just improvise this shit? And that whole project turned into uh, us basically improvising brutal death metal kind of non-ironically. I mean, it's, it's fun, but we're trying to get to the core of the point without spending thousands of hours trying to learn these songs that are totally atonal like you get you like practicing these riffs you can't even hear so we just fucking make it up as we go along yeah well i mean de death and metal in general especially like brutal brutal death metal i think that's an example of a genre of music i mean i was saying this actually with luke calzanetti when he was on here um that uh that it is a kind of music where there's tons of compositional complexity that's not accidental. It's very deliberately considered highly crafted music that's not uh, elitist. I mean, it is elitist in that, like, not everyone's into it, and it's kind of like, who cares if you don't like it? But, I mean, it's it's not class-wise. I mean, it's working-class art, a lot of it, you know? Um, it's not academic. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of a lot of people, a lot of the artists, they're not even taking credit really personally for their compositions. You know, like I, I don't know the names yeah. of all these guys that collectively write this hyper insane, uh, like riffs. You know, for death metal. So it's, I mean, there's really nothing like it as far as I mean. If you're, I mean, and a lot of non musicians listen to very technical death metal. Actually, I mean, more than. For jazz i think yeah but there's a whole cultural thing with heavy metal and that's huge um i relate to some aspects of it but i don't want to be a metal clone i'm not really interested in that you know what i'm saying like sure. it's not it's not postmodernism for me like i'm not trying to appropriate death metal like i really relate to it and i have for decades um but i'm not trying to fit in the mold of a heavy metal person i don't care about that shit at all um there's a lot of it's very conservative scene like in a lot of ways it's very conformist in a lot of ways that's not what i necessarily relate about it with yeah no i feel it i feel it absolutely um i mean black metal is similar uh, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Juan, Juan took the words right out of my mouth. He wants to know Weasel's opinion on black metal. Weasel has great taste in black metal. Well, you know, black metal, I got into the second wave of black metal in the early 90s when it was actually happening. Um, somebody gave me the Mayhem album, Day Mysterious Dom Satanist, kind of months after it was released. Uh, so I was hearing that shit on the cusp, like Immortal and Dark Throne and all the Norwegian shit. Um, and I did relate to it as iconoclasm, but really, honestly, by 2000, black metal seemed very uh, contrite to me, and it seemed like a shtick, and it seemed pretty fucking generic. Like, a lot of people like this sort of pretty, like arpeggiated folk music type black metal. I, that's not why I got into it. I got into it to be fucking rock and roll, not to be like ethereal or any of this crap. So, I mean, that's why eventually I drifted into war metal and then kind of drifted into brutal death metal because um, that's just what I'm looking for in music. I mean, the day mysterious Dom Satan is my favorite album of all time. And I've said that for probably at least a decade, if not more. I love that album to death, but in a way that that album is extremely iconoclastic. It's it, when it came out, it wasn't like a lot of other black metal and it still isn't. People have tried to copy it, but they're kind of missing the core, like the, the guts of it, you know, like what went into making that album and the sensibility and all that shit. So I don't know. I, 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 I tend to err on the side of death metal than black metal and yes. black metal is a type of death metal. And I'm very suspicious of people who say they like black metal and don't like death metal. Very suspicious of those people. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's like a fashion. It's like a fashion thing on or on on some level yeah. or whatever. I yeah. I mean black metal I, I don't know, it's yeah. like well wh- especially war metal. That is honestly a kind of thing that I was into when I was doing badly life-wise and now that i'm doing better like i yeah. actually don't need to listen to it. where like where the, there's other kind whereas like with death metal it doesn't matter how how happy i am i will like always be down to listen to like immolation or or whatever or even some psycho shit like devourment or whatever like i can listen to that in any mood but like i don't know just that war metal shit just like it's like i used to listen to like black witchery and shit like that and like i i, I just don't it's still like cool but i'm just like i do not it's too fucked up man i'm like i i have a kind of thing like that which is uh, for a long time i loved the most gutting um soul destroying movies and i used to call them feel bad movies uh yeah you know but now that my life situation has changed i mean i have a kid and you know like uh you know there's a lot of things going on that i I kind of, kind of got to deal with. I don't have the mental headspace to enjoy these kind of movies. Like the last thing I'm going to put on is like a Gaspar Noe or a Michael Haneke just... movie at this point. Like I just don't, was the name. I don't have any space in my life to feel bad. Yeah, exactly. So Dude, that was literally I don't know. I think my that's first kind thing. of similar. Like it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's like no. That movie was the first thing that came to mind. I was like, I used to love that movie. Now I'm just like enough rape i need to watch another fucking i mean it's just like it's just like that's all that's going on in the fucking world it seems like i need more on the fucking screen i don't know he's not even my favorite of that kind of thing although you know what i did watch recently um is the again is the piano teacher i mean and that's a lot more elegant that's that's not so much like just utter brutality but like that's i I, yeah that is such a sick movie man I love it. I love that movie. And do you did, did do you feel like the end of it, that last gesture where she sort of stabs herself and runs off? Do you feel like that's a punchline? Because I feel like that's almost like a like, but um, like at the end of the movie, like like a, like a deliberate letdown. No, like like it's literally a punchline. Like it, it, she's just sort of like the end of the movie is. I'm heartbroken, boo-hoo, and runs off. You know what I mean? Like, it, it just seems very, like, almost vaudevillian in some way to me, which maybe I'm just interpreting that weirdly. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I, I kind of I kind of took it like that for a while, but I, I, from a musician's perspective, I actually started thinking about it as, like, a hyper-brutal, like, or not hyper-brutal, but just, like, way darker. Because when you think about it, like, her career is, like, at a tipping point of, like, either like almost basically gonna go away and she's got this concert like this is the only like thing she's got going on is this rehearsal so to me the dark thing isn't the stabbing it's that she doesn't play the gig like she ditches the gig so that's it like she has no more fucking career at all after that so that's why i took that as like deeply suicidal if we're talking about you know what i mean like like she's just off the deep end she's no longer functioning in her scene so i don't know if that's how 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 uh I, Alfred Yelenek meant that, or, or or not, but um, that's it's that's a, a lot that of was different ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of damage in our world. A lot of people are walking around wounded, and it makes sense that this kind of stuff called heals people, whether death metal or these dark movies or, or whatever. I mean, shit is kind of dark, and I think it's better to have these outlets for that darkness rather than manifesting it in a real way on innocent people or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's therapy. Sure. Even, I don't know, when it comes to all the shit, though, like death metal, even the most gory lyrics or in black metal, even, like, the most racist or whatever, like, none of it's, like, that upsetting. I don't know. I mean, like, none of it, it's, none of it is, like, watching, like, the Gaspar Noe rape scene or something, you know? Like, it's not, like, hard it's not hard to listen to. Maybe Argo Slant is a little, little yeah. hard for me to listen to, j- j- but like I, uh, that's like a, a very extreme case. But um, in general, I think it's easy for us to say. You know, I think it's easy for us to say, and it's easier for us to kind of blow it off because we're not generally the who it's addressed towards. So I can understand why 
by someone who it's addressed towards would be very offended by it and yeah. not want to have anything to do with it. I guess it's just like have the, I'm going to save a word privilege, you know, to like fucking just be like, eh, whatever it's cool music or whatever. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't really care about that, but I can understand why other people wouldn't like it. So, you know, I don't necessarily try to, um, put it in anyone's face who doesn't want to no, no. deal with Dude, it. That's, that's my feeling as well. That's my feeling as well. But even for, for like death metal though, if, if we're not even talking about political shit, but just like the gore and stuff, or, I mean, that's yeah. never, I mean, I, I don't think there are that many people who, who actually find that traumatizing or, uh, I don't think there's that many people who are like, actually just like, uh, like, you know, um, feeling the horror, you know, like, uh, yeah, well, there's a huge thread in brutal death metal. That is a, extremely insanely in cell times a million a misogyny and it's pretty brutal and ugly and i don't feel that way about women you know and I, I i wouldn't want anyone to feel that because i like this music i endorse that kind of fucking behavior or outlook i certainly don't but at the same time it's abstract you know it's like i can like the Texas chainsaw massacre and not want to like murder people with a chainsaw or yeah. masturbate watching it you know i mean it's like whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's figurative. You know? What's the best? Um, <laughs> recommend recommend to the viewers. What's what's like the absolute state of the art of brutal like incel times a million uh, like rapist shit. Like what's what? Oh God, um, let me check my notes here. Um, there's so much of it. I mean, I, I I'm I'm gonna look at the list master list right now because you know honestly the the band that I'm super into right now in the brutal death metal field is half man half woman it's a band from texas called stabbing and i saw them live at a metal fest and they fucking wiped the floor with everybody there was something about them that just like was so hard and brutal and kind of like rocking and victorious like that's the irony is like maybe my favorite band in the idiom right now is actually half women so um right, <laughs> uh Man, I mean, I would, today I listened to uh, the the uh, American Disgorges album. What what the fuck is that called? Um, uh, you know, I, I actually don't have enough brain matter left to memorize all these titles either. Like, I just don't have. It's not sticking into my brain, so I have to keep notes. Oh yeah, I listen to Consume the Forsaken by Disgorge. They're the American Disgorge today, and that cover is. Uh, Oh, it's not that bad, actually. There was one I was listening to earlier that was really horrifying to the point where I don't even want to look at it. I mean, I kind of have to, like, you know, I have a kid. I got to kind of, like, uh, keep a, her away from these things. It can be yeah, fairly you traumatizing, you know. So I, I keep I, that I, shit I'm, up on the desktop, yeah. Yeah. Are there, are there, there's two Disgorges. Yeah, I mean, I, I oh, I, 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 there's like eight of them, but there's two good <laughs> ones. The, the two really good ones, there's a Mexican Disgorge. And there's one from San Diego, and they're both pretty good. They're different. The Mexican Disgorge is more of like a post carcass, like gore grind band that's just like super sloppy and just like blah. And the other Disgorge is just a really, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, they're just a typical brutal death metal band. Okay, yeah, the record I was I, the, with the worst artwork I listened to today was the sole album by uh, a, a San Diego band called cephalotripsy and they are they are what would be called ignorant death metal i mean it's really yes. artless it's just like no fucking intellectualism going on here and the cover art is atrocious it's just really uh, almost like i kind of can't look at it it's that, that bad but you know whatever it's like i'm into the music is it don't like, necessarily um, agree with their approach it's that is some information is it straight like uh is it like like a uh, wigger slam or what's the like, what's the vibe it's one of my favorite like genre it's, names it's probably one of the influences on that but it's yeah it's probably cephalotripsy is probably one of the no it's pre i mean it's probably one of the things that directly um you know, there's all these bands like, uh, you know, you mentioned Devourment a number of times, stuff like that. I mean, there's that that was all like there's there's been like a thread of that 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 is has um, progressed and changed through time. Cephalotripsy are early. They're like, you know, mid aughts, you know, stuff like that. But they're, um, you know, there's like a race to the top of being this really disgusting, misogynist, gross, like imagery and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not into that. I don't really. That's not my cup of tea, really. But at the same time. 
time. Um, I'm not going to like disassociate myself from it for that. I mean, I just, you know, whatever. When the music sounds, I can understand why it would be upsetting to other people. Yeah. I mean, imagery and lyrics. Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's kind of like disgusting. I mean, mean, you know what I I love about that kind of stuff and I I know it doesn't apply to all of it and it doesn't apply to war metal, but I mean, I think, I think a lot of this kind of like brutal death metal and shit that I've, that I've heard is like stuff that's just when, when the riffs are actually pretty complicated and worked out, but it's so lo-fi that you can't really even make it out, and it and it it comes off as like noise music almost, but they are actually doing all this like somewhat high tech shit, but it's in this way that's just vomit, like it just doesn't fucking matter, but it, it's like in there sort of, you know. That's, that's exactly the whole full impetus behind Incentifrac right there. You just basically re-explained it perfectly. Uh, I'm going to jump in and, and respond to some, some chat things yeah, right Yeah, 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 do that. It's um, great. Brain kind of don't really care. I, uh, somebody... Yeah, yeah oh, you're somebody breaking up. You're breaking is up. asking about brief time with Burmese. I was in, uh, okay, check one, two, check, 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 one, two. Any good? Better? No, that's better, yeah. Okay. I was in Burmese for two years. Someone's asking if I had a brief time. It was a pretty intense time. We did an album and an EP. It was probably one of the most productive periods in Burmese's history, thanks to yours truly. So that answers that question. Cephalotripsy art, LP artwork is so nasty, says Travis K. Correct. Um, brain bombs, I don't really care about, but the guys in Burmese like brain bombs. Um, somebody caught the Singapore sling reference on terror iridescence. Congratulations. Not in, I don't even know that. In yet. a wink to you. I love that movie and I love Mer- Meredith. Yeah, Meredith Harrell's performance in that is so amazing and so off the hook. She's fucking incredible. I had to devote something to her. The other side of that album is devoted to Tom Smith, who is one of my fallen peers who recently died of uh, cancer. And, uh, I don't know. That's just where I was. Like sometimes, you know, my music pays tribute to a lot of the masters and mistresses. So, um, Josh, uh, asks, as says sarcastically that I love Ian McKay. Um, I don't necessarily love him. I don't hate him. I've met the guy and he seemed certainly fine. I actually stayed, I, I went over to the discord house once with XBX Rex and he was Perfectly fine, supportive guy. I have no problem with Ian McKay. Um, yeah. What's my favorite horror film for both of us? Asks Juan Bor- Boris. Um, favorite horror film. That's a tough one. Uh, I got to think about that. You got an answer for that, Charlie? Um, well, I'm not a deep, deep horror guy. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, really just Hellraiser. I don't know. I mean, that was always just my thing. Growing up was was Hellraiser one and two three I lose the thread a little bit um, I think two Hellraiser two but this is I mean this is a somewhat normy like plebeian kind of answer you know I mean I'm I'm not a super deep uh, like baller as far as horror films go like I'm not watching that shit all the time I mean I've investigated it because I've had my little film um, eras where I've into films and stuff like that. But uh, I think mine's a little pedestrian too. I mean, I, I, I actually love the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I like Dawn of the Dead. I mean, those are kind of basic bitch oh, yeah. movies really, but they're kind of awesome mm-hmm. and they're very visceral. I mean, Singapore Sling is kind of a horror movie and I love that movie. I love it. Amazing. Blows my mind. Don't know. I can That's talk, like, yeah, you know, about like know shitty. Song. Yeah. I mean, Oh dude. Singapore Sling is, <laughs> you know what? I, I'm just going to let you investigate that one. I don't even want to like nutshell it, but it's one of the most psychotic yeah. movies I've ever seen. And it's, um, there's, there's a, an erotic vomiting scene that is quite amusing. I'll put it that way. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, man. That's how it goes sometimes. Right. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, are there any questions or any big questions we haven't really? Uh, yeah, I, don't know. I think we probably got to most of these. Let yeah, we've just kind of been back. blowing over the changes here. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions if anyone has any more questions. Blowing over the changes, man. Yeah. Got. 
the jazz and ecstasy. Yeah, I mean, we use that jazz. I don't know. Um, where you want to go with this? I mean, uh, we've been on here for two hours. I, think, I don't know. I Maybe we could take a few questions. Yeah, I mean, two. Yeah. I, two is if any, good you know what? Me. Anyone. Yeah. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, I'm so easily findable on social media and I'm very good about responding almost instantly. I love to rap with people about culture and stuff. So if anyone ever has any questions about my work or anything I've talked about or just music in general, uh, just get a hold of me and let's rap. Let's do it. Awesome. And, and as far as just plugging what's up yeah. immediately next, I mean, Lutenbachers is playing uh, two gigs in Chicago, right? Like uh, next month or yeah. 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 We're playing uh, October 23rd at uh, the Liars Club with Microwaves. Um, and we're playing October 25th with Child Abuse and Flesh Narc. That should be a banger. And then we have a gig in Ottawa at a festival on November something fifth sixth something like that um yeah i don't know it's low key i mean if people are interested in presenting with flying lutenbachers also reach out about that um it's going to cost money i'll just say that <laughs> yeah good pay um, this man yeah uh, yeah well you know pay me enough so that we, we aren't like killing ourselves to do this shit you know like it's you know, pay to play is a real term, you know, and um, I've definitely paid some dues to do this and, you know, gets diminishing returns at some point. So, yeah. yeah, for real. All right, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been a great one. And I think we I think we manage the, uh, the there's been this weird muttering sound. You hear this right this whole time. This underneath is it my fan hold on a second hold on no no it's like some weird feedback shit whoa no i don't hear yeah, it it doesn't matter the damage is done um yeah people can hear it but i think it's uh, yeah, who knows um yeah we did an awesome job we did an awesome job uh negotiating the complexities and, yeah um, the four second delay thing is fucking awful but whatever four seconds is a lot yeah but uh, yeah, thanks for everyone in the chat. And um, yeah, Weasel, I don't know when I'll be in Chicago anytime soon, but I'll be in New York next month. But you, but you probably won't, I guess, right? Not really. I mean, I still have some stuff going in New York, but I, I don't know the next time I'm there right now. I mean, whatever. I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, dude, I'll talk to you soon, I hope. Yeah. Rock and roll. Peace, man.